Dick Van Dyke, a legendary figure in the American entertainment landscape whose illustrious career has spanned over seven decades, delivered a stunning revelation that left his devoted fans in a state of disbelief. In a shocking turn of events, he publicly acknowledged engaging in adulterous behavior, a confession that sent shockwaves through the public and had far-reaching consequences, ultimately leading to the disintegration of his once vibrant marriage. But Van Dyke's admission did not conclude with his infidelity. He bravely admitted to grappling with alcoholism, a relentless demon that tormented him and played a pivotal role in the gradual erosion of the bond between him and his wife. For details on Dick Van Dyke's behavior, watch this video until the end. Dick Van Dyke, known for his versatile career spanning nearly seven decades, has left an indelible mark on the world of entertainment. His journey from The Dick Van Dyke Show to Diagnosis Murder and from his famously criticized London accent in Mary Poppins to his appearances in Night at the Museum showcases his enduring talent and appeal. Throughout his illustrious career, Dick Van Dyke has garnered admiration for his comedic timing, impeccable acting skills, and innate ability to connect with audiences. However, his path to success was not without its challenges. Van Dyke battled alcoholism at a certain point in his life, a struggle he openly addressed and overcame, becoming an inspiration to others facing similar difficulties. Tragedy has also marked Van Dyke's personal life, with the devastating loss of his first wife and long-term partner. These heartaches tested his resilience, but he continued to forge ahead, determined to honor their memory by embracing the opportunities life had to offer. At the age of 90, Dick Van Dyke surprised the world when he married his second wife, Arlene Silver, who is 45 years his junior in 2012. Their unconventional love story demonstrated that age is just a number when it comes to matters of the heart, and their enduring partnership has been a testament to the power of love and companionship. Van Dyke's career has seen him play a wide range of roles but perhaps one of the most memorable moments in his life was when he arrived in London to film Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. His iconic presence was met with an unexpected twist as his appearance seemed to transform him into an anonymous figure. His naturally wavy hair seemed to curl even more, and few members of the English crew even recognized him. It was as if he had stepped into a parallel universe, where he was no longer the famed actor he had always been. A humorous anecdote from the set of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang highlights the extent of his transformation. During the filming of the movie's opening racetrack scene, an assistant director walked through a crowd of extras, distributing flags for them to wave as the cars passed by. To Dick Van Dyke's surprise, he too was offered a flag. Puzzled, he protested, but I'm in the movie. The assistant director, with a chuckle, replied, Not yet, mate, but you will be if you wave that pennant when the camera is pointed at you. Initially, Van Dyke had repeatedly declined the opportunity to star in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The film's producer, Albert Cubby Broccoli, who was renowned for his meticulous control of the James Bond franchise, had an ambitious vision. He was determined to reunite the beloved duo of Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke after their remarkable success in Mary Poppins. However, both actors had their reservations, and Van Dyke in particular had some reservations about the project. Van Dyke's reluctance was partly due to his perception of the script, which he felt had too many plot holes and unanswered questions. He was clearly not convinced that the project was a worthwhile endeavor. However, Cubby Broccoli was determined to secure his participation and kept returning with increasingly tempting offers. The financial incentive was substantial, with Van Dyke revealing that the offers reached more than seven figures, a sum that was truly mind-boggling in those days. Additionally, Broccoli sweetened the deal by offering Van Dyke a percentage of the film's back-end profits, a bonus that the actor had never counted on. Under such persistent and lucrative persuasion, Dick Van Dyke eventually agreed to take on the role. 
However, he wasn't entirely ready to embrace the English accent that had caused him some difficulty in Mary Poppins. Fortunately, this was not an obstacle. In a clever move, the character he was set to portray was transformed into an eccentric American inventor, removing the need for him to revisit the challenging English accent. This adjustment allowed Van Dyke to feel more comfortable and confident in his role. The production of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang spanned an extensive ten months, with its headquarters in England but also taking the cast and crew to locations in Bavaria and the south of France. This ambitious filming schedule and the diverse set of locations contributed to the film's visually stunning and international feel. As production shuttled between London and the south of France, Margie encountered health issues that raised concerns about her well-being. A local doctor suspected that she might be dealing with cervical cancer, a diagnosis that naturally caused anxiety and urgency. In response to his wife's health crisis, Van Dyke made the difficult decision to prioritize his family and requested a temporary leave from the film. He approached the film's producer, Cubby Broccoli, with his situation, and to his relief, Cubby understood the gravity of the situation and offered his support, wishing Van Dyke well during this challenging time. With Margie taking their children back to California for a series of medical tests, Van Dyke flew back home to be by her side during this uncertain period. Fortunately, the medical tests eventually yielded a negative result, alleviating the initial fears of cervical cancer. Relieved and grateful, Van Dyke promptly returned to Europe to resume filming. However, what awaited him upon his return was a disheartening revelation from his agent. Cubby Broccoli had decided to dock Van Dyke a staggering $80,000 for his absence from work during that critical period. The news of this financial penalty left Van Dyke incensed and understandably hurt, considering the personal nature of his absence and the unexpected medical situation his family had faced. This incident, compounded by the financial setback, only added to Van Dyke's growing frustration with the production of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It wasn't just the financial matter that soured his experience. He had also become increasingly unimpressed with the film's director, Ken Hughes. Van Dyke believed that Hughes was the wrong fit for the picture, and this sentiment was amplified by hearing Hughes grumble about having to rewrite Roald Dahl's script. To Van Dyke, this raised questions about the creative direction of the film and the degree of respect for the source material. To Van Dyke, Mary Poppins held a special place in his heart, and he considered it a film of unparalleled magic and charm. He reminisced about the pivotal moment when he first read the script for Mary Poppins. The script left such a profound impression on him that he couldn't contain his excitement and immediately turned to his first wife, Margie, to share his enthusiasm. He described the script as nothing short of sensational, and this sentiment was a testament to the profound impact the story had on him. In Mary Poppins, Van Dyke played the role of Bert, the lovable chimney sweep, opposite Julie Andrews, who portrayed the iconic character of Mary Poppins herself. The collaboration between Van Dyke and Andrews was a match made in cinematic heaven, and their on-screen chemistry was undeniable. Van Dyke held Andrews in high regard, both as an actress and as a person. He emphasized her qualities, describing her as a lady first and foremost, with a profound sense of grace and dignity. One of the qualities that particularly stood out to Van Dyke was Julie Andrews' remarkable sense of humor. Despite her stature and elegance, she possessed a whimsical and infectious sense of humor that endeared her to everyone on set. Van Dyke marveled at the fact that he never witnessed her display anger or voice a single complaint during the filming of Mary Poppins. This combination of grace, humor, and professionalism made Julie Andrews an extraordinary co-star and a joy to work with. One remarkable aspect of Julie Andrews' involvement in Mary Poppins was her keen instincts when it came to the film's music. 
Van Dyke recalled that before officially agreeing to take on the role, Andrews had expressed hesitation regarding the romantic ballad titled Through the Eyes of Love. She had candidly requested Walt Disney to replace it with something else. The creative duo, the Sherman Brothers responsible for the film's music, took on the challenge and delivered what would become one of the all-time great fixes in cinematic history, A Spoonful of Sugar. This decision not only showcased Julie Andrews' spot-on instincts, but also led to the creation of an iconic and beloved song that has transcended generations. Beyond her impeccable judgment in song choices, Julie Andrews possessed a voice that left Dick Van Dyke in awe. He humorously admitted that her singing ability was so extraordinary that it scared him. He likened her voice to being capable of tuning a piano, a testament to her incredible vocal precision and pitch-perfect talent. In contrast, Van Dyke playfully admitted that he was never quite on par with her in terms of vocal perfection. Recording scenes with Julie Andrews proved to be a challenge for Van Dyke. The filming process often involved moments where the actors were suspended on high wires, meant to create the illusion of floating. These scenes required meticulous adjustments of lighting, camera angles, and occasional retakes, which meant a lot of hanging around in the air. Sometimes there were breaks for lunch, and Van Dyke humorously recalled an incident where the crew started to leave, forgetting that he, Julie, the children, and Ed Wynn were all strapped into wires and suspended 30 feet above the ground. In such moments, Van Dyke had to remind the crew with a playful yell, Guys, don't forget about us! These anecdotes shed light on the technical challenges and humorous mishaps that can occur during the filming of a movie, even one as iconic as Mary Poppins. Throughout the production, there was a shared understanding among the cast and crew that Mary Poppins was a truly special project. This sentiment was validated when the film had its star-studded premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood at the end of August 1964. The audience's enthusiastic response was palpable as they rose to their feet in a standing ovation. For Van Dyke, Mary Poppins and The Dick Van Dyke Show are the crown jewels of his 60-plus years in the entertainment industry. These two projects hold a timeless appeal that continues to entertain and captivate future generations. Their enduring popularity is a testament to Van Dyke's talent and the timeless quality of the work he contributed to these iconic productions. In his early career, Van Dyke didn't have a grand master plan or an elaborate career strategy. His primary motivation was quite straightforward, to provide for his family and ensure they had a roof over their heads. He pursued acting opportunities wherever they presented themselves, following the path that led to gainful employment. One such opportunity arose in 1963, when he joined the cast of Bye Bye Birdie, a film in which he was partnered with Janet Leigh, known for her role in the classic thriller Psycho. Van Dyke fondly described her as a real doll and highlighted the fun they had both on and off camera. However, a revealing incident occurred during the production that shed light on the dynamics between the cast members. One afternoon, Janet Lee expressed her dissatisfaction with the amount of screen time she was receiving, feeling that it was less than what had been initially indicated. This led Van Dyke and Lee to step inside the soundstage for a closer look. What they witnessed was Anne Margaret the film's young star, sitting on the director George Sidney's lap. The realization that Anne Margaret's role was becoming increasingly central while Lee's part was diminishing took both Van Dyke and Lee by surprise. Janet Lee was understandably upset by this discovery, as she had not anticipated such a dramatic shift in the film's focus. This behind-the-scenes incident illustrates the complexities and occasional rivalries that can emerge during the production of a film, even one as beloved as Bye Bye Birdie. When the film wrapped, George Sidney hosted a party at his lavish Beverly Hills mansion to thank the cast and crew. During the event, Paul Lind, Van Dyke's co-star, made a memorable and candid remark. 
Holding his wine glass, as if about to express gratitude, he humorously deviated from the expected tone. With a playful twist, Lindy addressed Anne Margaret directly, stating, Anne Margaret, I just want you to know that I'm the only one at this table who doesn't want to screw you. Dick Van Dyke's experience on the set of What a Way to Go in 1963, a star-studded production featuring Shirley MacLaine, Paul Newman, Robert Mitchum, and Dean Martin, offered a glimpse into the camaraderie, fun, and even the surprising professionalism that could exist amidst the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. One of the memorable moments from the film for Van Dyke was a scene he had with Dean Martin. However, as they were working together, Van Dyke couldn't help but notice that Dean Martin appeared to be under the influence of alcohol. His behavior suggested that he might have had a bit too much to drink, and Van Dyke had doubts about the usability of the footage they were shooting. Dean Martin had a reputation for enjoying alcoholic beverages, and it seemed that this behavior extended to the set of What a Way to Go. Van Dyke observed that Dean would indulge in drinking while entertaining beautiful women who came to visit him on set. This laissez-faire attitude towards alcohol and the presence of attractive companions created an atmosphere that was reminiscent of a perpetual happy hour. However, what surprised Van Dyke and everyone involved in the production was Dean Martin's remarkable ability to perform, even while seemingly inebriated. When Van Dyke saw the footage of Dean Martin on screen, he was astonished to find that there was no discernible sign of his inebriation. The actor's professionalism and talent transcended his off-screen behavior, leaving viewers completely unaware of the challenges he may have faced during the shoot. Van Dyke's wife, Margie, had never been particularly fond of Hollywood or its stars, but there was an exception made when they received an invitation that was too enticing to pass up, a dinner cooked by none other than Frank Sinatra. This exclusive evening promised a delightful combination of food, booze, stories, and laughter, all hosted by the legendary crooner himself. However, there was one thing Margie longed for that evening, to hear Sinatra's famous voice. Unfortunately, Sinatra was a man who did things his way, and that night, he was more interested in showcasing his culinary skills. Frank Sinatra's chosen menu for the evening included pasta with tomato sauce and garlic bread, followed by a homemade chocolate cake for dessert. While Margie had hoped to enjoy the renowned Sinatra voice, it became evident that on this occasion, he had no intention of singing. This unique experience allowed Van Dyke and his wife to see a different side of Sinatra, emphasizing his love for cooking and his desire to share a more personal and intimate evening with friends. However, amidst the glitz and glamour of Hollywood and these entertaining moments, there was something in Dick Van Dyke's life that he had been grappling with. He had a hidden problem with alcohol, one that had been gradually escalating over the years. By August 1972, he had reached a breaking point and realized that it was time to confront his issue head on. Van Dyke's relationship with alcohol had evolved from being a social drinker to something more destructive. He had reached a point where he would engage in a daily race with Margie to see if he could get drunk before she could prepare dinner. Despite not identifying himself as an alcoholic, he recognized the need for help and decided to seek treatment. He checked into a hospital for alcohol treatment, where he was placed in the psychiatric ward alongside other individuals struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction. They were separated from those with more severe emotional issues, but they could hear the turmoil and suffering of fellow patients. Some were experiencing withdrawal symptoms, including fits, vomiting, and the distressing effects of delirium tremens, DTs. In contrast, Van Dyke experienced none of these severe side effects. After three weeks of treatment, Dick Van Dyke achieved sobriety for the first time in nearly 15 years. Upon his release from treatment, Van Dyke expected to be reunited with his wife Margie, who had come to pick him up. However, he was in for a surprise when the counselor informed him that Margie had checked herself into the same facility. Her struggle was different. She had become dependent on Librium, a medication prescribed for anxiety and depression. Van Dyke had been unaware of her addiction, 
and this revelation created a complex situation where both he and his wife were grappling with substance abuse issues. The irony of their parallel struggles was not lost on them, a married couple facing addiction together. In the aftermath of his treatment, Van Dyke faced the challenging reality of staying sober. Unfortunately, he experienced several relapses, highlighting the arduous nature of recovery. While he struggled with his sobriety, Margie opted for a quieter life at their desert ranch, seeking solitude to address her own issues. By 1975, Van Dyke found solace in his conversations with Michelle Triola, his agent secretary. Their rapport and understanding of each other's struggles fostered a deep connection. At the time, Michelle was involved in a legal battle with actor Lee Marvin, with whom she had a significant relationship. In a surprising turn of events, Van Dyke found himself drawn into a romantic relationship with Michelle, despite being married to Margie. The guilt he felt was overwhelming, and he grappled with the complexities of his newfound situation. Realizing the need for honesty and a resolution to the conflicting emotions he was experiencing, Van Dyke decided that something needed to change. By 1976, he and Margie engaged in a series of emotional and productive discussions. Ultimately, they reached a significant decision to continue living their lives separately, effectively leading separate lives while remaining married. This arrangement allowed them both to pursue their own paths and address their personal issues without the constraints of a traditional marriage. However, it wasn't until 1981 that Dick Van Dyke and Margie made this arrangement permanent, marking the official end of their marriage. Even after undergoing treatment for alcoholism, Van Dyke continued to battle to stay sober. However, a significant turning point occurred when he suddenly lost his taste and tolerance for alcohol. This transformation came unexpectedly one evening while he and others were making dinner. After taking a sip of wine, he realized that it was making him feel unwell, and he promptly put the glass down. From that moment on, his desire to drink vanished. This shift in his relationship with alcohol was a welcome change and marked a pivotal moment in his ongoing recovery. Van Dyke's commitment to his physical well-being was evident as he maintained an active and healthy lifestyle. He humorously quipped that he stayed in shape to avoid assisted living, but his dedication to staying active exceeded what many people half his age might consider. He continued to work in the entertainment industry, participating in television specials and TV detective movies, demonstrating his enduring passion for performing. In 2005, Van Dyke embraced a physical challenge once again when he appeared in the Ben Stiller movie Night at the Museum. He even performed a dance scene showcasing his remarkable energy and vitality. His performance left an impression on Stiller, who affectionately began referring to him as Dorian Van Dyke, a nod to the fictional character Dorian Gray, who remains eternally youthful. However, amid his personal successes and resilience, tragedy struck in the form of devastating losses. In 2007, Dick Van Dyke's long-divorced ex-wife Margie was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Her illness deeply affected him, as it marked the loss of a part of his life and history, despite their separation. A year later, another heartbreaking blow came when Michelle, the woman he had been involved with during a challenging period of his life, received a grim diagnosis. Her doctor discovered a spot on her lung, and her health rapidly declined. During her last week, she was in a coma, but her doctor assured Van Dyke that she could still hear. In her final moments, he sang and talked to her, offering comfort and solace until she passed away. What do you think about Dick Van Dyke's tragic marriage? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.